Ecclesiastes chapter 2, no fulfillment without God. And we're going to read the first 17 verses here. In chapter 2, verse 1, it says, I said in mine heart, Go to now, I will prove thee with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure. And behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of mirth, what doeth it? I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainted my heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. I made me great works, and I built me houses, I planted me vineyards, I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I made me pools of water, to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maid servants, and servants born in my house, and I had a great possession of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. And so I was great and increased more than all that they were before, all that, all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever my eyes desired, I kept not from them, and I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. And then I looked in all the works that my hands had wrought in all the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. And I turned myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly, for what can a man do that cometh after the king, even that which had been already done? In other words, there's nothing new under the sun. And then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly as far as light excelleth darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself perceived also that one event happened to, it, happened it to them all. And then said I in my heart, as it happened to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said to my heart, that this also is vanity, for there is no remembrance of the wise more than the fool forever. Seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten, and how, he die, how dieth the wise man as the fool. Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spear. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for another chance to get up and to preach your word. And I pray that you would just guide us, Lord, help our hearts to, to understand that there is nothing new under the sun. And, and, and the thing that does value, the thing that does help, and, and where we can find pleasure, Lord, those things that please you and you alone. Lord, I pray that you would just help, help our hearts again and, and, and let us feel that conviction of the Holy Spirit. And may everything that we say or do, everything that we think or feel, may be glorifying to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. A man by the name of Oscar Wilde, you might know the name. He was an Anglo-Irish individual, a man uh, who grew up in a time probably about uh, early, late, late 1800s, early 1900s, somewhere around that time frame. He was born to a, a, a good, well-to-do sort of family, at least in my eyes that he was. His father was a surgeon. His mother kind of did the same sort of work like Lisa Baghdadi, like, her, her, like what she does, you know, an editor, a literature uh, professional of sorts, and, and that's what their profession was. So he was well-to-do in, in that sort of mindset, and you can imagine why he got into writing novels and playwrights and, and was a critic and other sorts of things in London. Uh, he was educated in Trinity College in Dublin and Magdalen College in Oxford. And while he was at Oxford, he became in what was came involved in what was known as the aesthetic movement. And if you know anything about that, which I didn't know before I looked it up, but the aesthetic movement was in the Victorian period. In that day and age, he, he they they saw it as being too conservative and too traditional, too hard nosed. Uh, for somebody like him to deal with. And so they went to the opposite end of the spectrum and they started dealing with more of uh, what Solomon would become involved with, more of uh, pleasure and more of being at ease and relaxed and, I guess, promiscuity and sensualism and that sort of, of thing. And so he got involved in the arts and, and, and things of that nature and he would have been considered probably like uh, Elvis Presley 
uh, back of the 50s and 60s at that time. Uh, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but I believe that's probably as close as I can describe him. Uh, but once he, 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 after he became famous and looked at the end of his life and all the playwrights and all the, all the things that he had written or been involved in or been accredited with, his great fame and, that he had been given... He says this at the end of it. He says, The gods had given me almost everything, but I let myself be lured into long spells of senselessness and sensual ease. Tired of being on the heights, I deliberately went on the depths and searched for new sensation. What the paradox was to me in the sphere of thought, perversity came to me in the sphere of passion. I grew careless of the lives of others. I took pleasure where it pleased me, and I passed on. I forgot that every little action of the common day makes or unmakes character, and that therefore what one has done in the secret chamber, one has someday to cry aloud from the housetop. I ceased to be lord over myself. I was no longer the captain of my soul, and I did not know it. I allowed pleasure to dominate me, and I ended in horrible disgrace. And we see here that the pleasure-seeking pattern of, of modern-day man, the things that, that many people go seeking after and thinking, this is going to bring pleasure, this is going to bring satisfaction in my life, and, and I want to wrap my whole heart into seeking this thing that brings me pleasure, satisfaction, and, and this is what I want to make of my life. And they turn their backs on God, such as Solomon has, has done. You know, he's experimenting everything that's done under the sun. They, they find out that it's vanity. They find out that it's vexation and spear, as he says here within his word. And Solomon, he's tried it all, and I believe that he lifts up his voice as a preacher would. And all those who would go and try the things of the world, he would say, you know, it's all vanity, it's all vexation. Don't go this path and don't go this way. Don't try it. There's something more than the, the pleasure that you're seeking here on this earth. Whether it's uh, the, the seek uh, the pleasure of the flesh, whether it's to seek uh, great esteem and success, or to seek, uh, I mean, you name it. People find pleasure in various sort of things. It's not just in sensualism. It could be in building. It could be in planting gardens. It could be in, in the greatest roses. It could be in the, in, in the luxury lifestyle that some people desire to look. They, they look at the, the rich and famous and they say, I wish I could have that. And they go pursuing it. And that's pleasure to them. Maybe it's in cooking. I, I don't know what it is. But some, they, pleasure can, can and cross a wide spectrum of things. It's not just in one area or the other. And so he was a, a herald who teetered on the brink of woe and he was warning young men and women, don't make the same mistakes that I did and don't get a snare for your souls. Don't fall for the same deceitful tricks of the devil who allures you away and the next thing you know you're looking at the end of the, your life uh, where you let your family, you let everything pass you on by because you're, you're, you became entrapped and this thing called pleasure. And he's saying here, don't get caught up in that way of thinking. Don't get caught up in this trap. What will it take for you to turn to God with your whole heart? How many disappointments do you have to face? When will you stop being dominated by the devil's allure of pleasure only to be disgraced? And so a pursuit of pleasure will never fulfill the most basic need that we have. And you must pursue God for only then will you be pleased with your life. And so I want you to see here uh, again that pleasure crosses a wide spectrum of things. And here we see some of the things that Solomon pursued. He began to run after pleasure. And we, we'll point this out as we go through and look through chapter 2 here in our text. I want you to notice uh, that the pleasure proceeded from his heart first of all. He said, I said in my heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth, and therefore enjoy pleasure. Now, it's nothing new that he's pursuing the, the things of his heart. Look there in, in chapter 1, in verse 13, where he says, I gave my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom. There, that's chapter 1. In verse 16, he says, yea, at the end of it, he says, yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. Verse 17, And I gave my heart to know wisdom and uh, know wisdom and to know madness and folly. And so we see here that Solomon is going to a great extent to follow his heart. He's not looking for the 
for the wisdom that God had granted to them, to follow after the Spirit or follow after truth and follow after righteousness. No, it says here that he's following after his heart. In fact, you know, uh, we see it there in verse 1. I said in my heart, go to now. Verse 3, I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainted uh, my heart with wisdom. In verse 10, he says, Whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced. And so you see the emphasis that he places on his heart, and he's letting his heart be his guide, so such as you would see in Hollywood or Disney or, or whatever have you that they put out there. They say, just follow your heart. Follow your gut instincts. You know, just believe in yourself. Just trust in the thing that you know to be true. And, and the Bible paints a completely different picture for ourselves. If we were to follow our heart, the Bible says, My heart is dece deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And who can know it? And this is what they're putting before the, the, our children, putting before Hollywood, putting before our faces. You need to follow your heart. And that's what many of the Hollywood stars are going after. But again, he says, his heart is deceitfully wicked. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Ecclesiastes 9, 3 says, The heart of the sons of men is full of evil, and madness is in their heart while they live. And after, they go, and after that they go to the dead. There's a sociologist, uh, Robert Bellow, who calls the worldview uh, expressive individualism. Uh, the same thing as the follow your heart sort of mentality. They say it's just an expressive individualism and they're following uh, that thing that they're just expressing what's automatically in the inside. Charles Taylor, he, he coined it the age of authenticity. And, and again, it's, it's, it's just nothing new, nothing new under the sun. But what's inside of the heart? What did Jesus say proceeds out of the heart? He says it was the evil, it was adulteries, wickedness, theft. I mean, the, all kinds of evil proceeds out of the heart. And the point was in Matthew chapter, or Mark chapter 6, I believe it was, when they, when they said that, that you, know, you ought to get your disciples to wash your hands, and Jesus confronted them, he says, it's not what you put into your mouth. The defiles of man is the things that come out of the heart, that seed of emotion, that heart that's there, that the people are following. That's what defiles a man. Because our hearts are far from the truth, and yet this is what Solomon is following after. But what does the Bible say that the Christians should follow after? It's not the heart, it's the spirit. We ought to follow after the Spirit of God, and I know that there's that war between the flesh and the Spirit, and constantly, every day, and we need to be fighting against it, not be led by it, but we need to be led by the truth of the Word of God, led by the Spirit of God, and trust Him, because it's the only right way that we can go. It's the only way that we would be profited, helped, and, and blessed by God, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's contrary to Christianity... Because a Christian is commanded to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. And so we need to resist the flesh and the faith and be led of the Spirit. Uh, and, and, and believe it or not, this is a sort of the same language I, I've found. It's in Luke chapter 12, verse 19 that they use here. From here in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I said in my heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore enjoy pleasure in Luke chapter 12, verse 19. He says, and I will say to my soul, again, that inward communing with your very own soul, this is what Solomon musing within his heart, uh, and I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for, thy, for many years, and take thy knees, eat, drink, and be merry. Isn't this what Solomon is doing? And he's sitting back and he's taking his, he, he, he's evaluating, he's expending all of his energy, all of his resources, all of his money, at the expense of pleasure. At the expense of pleasure. So Solomon's heart went after uh, some many things that I, I doubt that he would have done had he been led by the Spirit. Look at verse 3. Verse 3 says, I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine and acquainted my heart uh, with, much, with, with, with wisdom and to lay hold on folly till I might see what was that good 
for the sons of men which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. And so we find out, first of all, uh, here one of the things that Solomon's heart went after was wine. It was wine. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, the Bible says, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, what does it say? And be not drunk with wine, where is in excess? But do what? Be filled with the Spirit. But here Solomon, he's not following the wisdom of the Lord because he can if you're drinking wine. And he's drunk with this wine. He's not even following his mother's advice. If you look over to Proverbs chapter 31, in Proverbs chapter 31 in verse 4, it says, uh, Again, it's not for kings, O Lemuel. It's not for kings to drink wine or for princes strong drink. He's, he's throwing all of his mother's advice out the window and yet we see the excuses that he's using here. The same excuse that you, you might hear from other people, maybe younger people or whatever. And I believe that he's saying here, you know what, well it's fine because I, I'm not getting drunk. I don't know if you get that here, but look there again at verse 3. He says, I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine, but that next verse there says, yet acquainted my heart with wisdom. Yet acquainted my heart with wisdom. He says, in other words, you know, I only got drunk so much, but I had my wisdom. It was still with me. It still uh, maintained within my spirit. I, I didn't get so drunk that I was out of my mind. And so he justifies himself. He thinks to himself, well, it's going to be okay because I've only drank so much and, uh, you know, nobody shouldn't have a problem with that. Well, you know what? I don't know anybody who's ever uh, drank wine or drank strong drink and didn't involve themselves in some sort of foolishness. You know what I mean? There's always foolishness involved, you know, uh, whether they, they gain themselves, get themselves involved in something they wouldn't have normally done, in other words, uh, except for they had drinking this, this, this drink here, this wine, this drink that he involves himself in. Uh, I've never known a drunk that you can count on. I've never known a drunk who is faithful, uh, but do you know what people who drink do? They do foolishness. And any man who puts alcohol in his mouth has lost his senses, and he's poisoned his body. Solomon also built great houses. There's nothing wrong with that. He planted fruit, tre uh, the fruit trees. He planted flower gardens. He made irrigation systems for, his, for his, the, the flowers and for the fruit trees and other things like that. I believe that's what he's talking about, the pools of, of water. He had servants, he had substance, he had silver, he had singers in, in abundance. All this was encapsulated in the eye. They therefore, enjoy pleasure. And so that word enjoy there it means to involve yourself, experience, check it out, consider what it has for you. Enjoy it while you can. He, 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 he's trying to prove, he's trying to find out, is there any worth, is there any profit, is there any good to this, this work of pleasure here. I believe it's similar to the men in our day who goes out to work and they work for a living and at the end of the day, before you know it, they're sitting back in their chair. They think to themselves, well, it's okay, you know, I've worked hard so I can sit back and I can enjoy myself. It's all right if I have a drink or two. It's all right if I just waste all my time watching TV. And it's okay if I don't do anything else, if I don't uh, serve the Lord. This is my time uh, sort of mentality. I, I believe that this is uh, his mindset. It's sort of an escapism. You know what escapism, right? Escapism is trying to pull himself. He's, he feels trapped in the world that he's put himself in. He's, he's trapped in the cycle of work. He's trapped in the cycle of pleasure. He's, he's trapped in this world and he doesn't seem to be able to get out of it. And the only way to escape from it is to be involved in some sort of entertainment, some sort of a thing that just helps him to escape reality for what it really is. But it doesn't go away. The responsibilities are still there. The, the, the entrapments, the, the, I guess the accountability to God is still there. It doesn't go away. And so here Solomon is sought for this sort of escapism and all the pleasure and all the, the, the things you can fabricate within your heart. But he finds that there's nothing to it. There's still no escape. We get there to verses 12 through, through, through 17 there and he begins to compare the 
the wise man and the foolish man. And he says, well, I, all of us die alike. And through all my pleasure and all the profiting that I thought that I could do, the only thing that's appointed unto me is, is, is death, just like the So what makes the difference? If I'm working, if I'm trying to enjoy myself, and we're all going to... What, what makes the difference? Because he says there's no satisfaction in pleasure. It's all vanity. It's all vexation of spirit. And it hasn't helped him one bit. In fact, he still finds himself disappointed, disheartened, disillusioned through all of it. And so he, he sits here and he's going to review the performance of everything that he's done with under the sun. And, and Solomon reviews this experiment. He looks in verse 11, Then I looked on the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I labored to do. And, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. And there was no profit under the sun, is what he said. Nothing that, nothing that I put my hand to do. I've, I've built many different houses and it's vexation, it's vanity. There's nothing there. I, I've helped many people. I've done so much work. I've, I've planted gardens. I've, I, I've enjoyed life to the fullest extent and it's still vexation. It's still vanity. There's still nothing to show for my life. That's what he's saying. Solomon's experiment proves to all people always and everywhere that the uh, uh, deliberate systematic pursuit of pleasure fails to secure its end. And, and does the Bible say... You know, Galatians chapter 6, it says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And he that sows to the flesh shall reap what? Corruption. But he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And here we find a man who's done all that he can, and he's sown to the flesh, just one day after another, sown to the flesh, and all the opportunities he had to live for God, his salt went to the he's he's an old man now. All the times that he could have uh, just but instead he lived for the world. He lived for the the excitement of the minute. He he, he looked for all that he could get and, and, and there was nothing there. Solomon found it all to be a waste of time and left empty handed. It was vanity, it was emptiness. It's like having a a treasure chest. You know, you have a treasure chest and you're supposed to have all these treasures in there. After after a while, you know, you build it up and you build it up and you would expect a treasure at the end of the day and he looks at it all after he's experimented with the, the, the pleasure and the pursuit of pleasure. And he finds it's empty. It's like having a gun with no bullets. It's like having uh, a car with no engine or transmission. I mean, it's there's, there's no profit to it. There's no gain to it. And, and it's like a man without God is when we boil it down to a man without God. Everything that you do, it's all vanity. It's all vexation of spirit because the only thing that drives us is our love, is a worship for God, a yearning for God. And that's what we need to give our hearts, to give our lives, to give our motives, to give our every desire, to yield, as I said this morning, to be sold out for God on our every avenue of life. We're summoned to a purer and wiser search on a worthier and nobler course. And so here he finds that there's nothing, nothing left for him to do. And then he realizes three things that I want us to see, three lessons in closing. Just real quick. He sees all the labor and everything that he's done and the Bible says that there's pleasure in sin for what? For a season. Only pleasure in sin for a season. You see, he had to go from one thing right after another. The, the, the wine wasn't enough. The building of the houses wasn't enough. The, the building the flower gardens. The doing, doing everything. It was never enough. And so it was only for a season that he would find satisfaction. Only for a season that he would find enjoyment. And it was never enough. And he even found at the end of it all, when he was an old man, there's nothing there. It was only for a season. Yes, there was enjoyment for a short period of time, but regret afterwards. There was excitement, maybe a thrill, maybe a, 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 just a jump to your soul, and yet at the end of it, you found guilt and regret and, and disappointment and disillusionment. It was only for a season. 
Even Moses, when he looked at all the riches of, of Egypt, said, I'd rather have the reproaches of Christ than all the riches of, that Egypt ever had to offer. They had everything in the known world at that known time, and, and he, he turned his back on being the next Pharaoh. He turned his back on the riches. Turned his back on the wealth. Turned his back on the fame. Just to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years, but he was doing it for the work of God. It was pleasure and sin for a season. Number two, it was fraught with struggle. In other words, he's, he's working and working and working and working, and at the end of it all, he sees that there was no profit to it. I don't know if you've ever been there. You know, it was when I first got married, thinking to myself, you know, I'm looking... We, I'm, I'm like all of you guys when you first got started out, brother... Brother Coon was telling me about how it started out as a small little trailer. Didn't have, he always working and working and working. You guys told me how you started out with nothing. I mean, I remember renting our first trailer. I was proud of that thing, you know. Uh, the skirting was ripped off of it. I mean, it looked god awful. Uh, holes in the floor. I mean, problems with the plumbing, problems with the electricity. But I was proud of it, and I went and I invested myself into it. R did a lot of electrical work to it. Fixed all the skirting. I mean... <laughs> I, I say I fixed it, you know, you know what I mean by fix it. Uh, I put it up the way it was supposed to be, and you know, the skirting's white. I went to Walmart and got some white duct tape and stretched it over, over the holes. <laughs> to me, I was fixing it, you know. It was better than what it was with the holes. <laughs> but I fixed the plumbing, I fixed the holes. I, I mean, I patched it up the best I could with what finances that I had at the time. Uh, and I invested myself into making it look good because I wanted my wife to be proud of me. I wanted people to come over to see my house. I didn't want to be ashamed of them coming. I said, come on over. I've invested my... And it was a lot of hard work. And you know, after we moved out to the, the next place where we moved, somebody else moved in. And I mean, they, living in a trailer park, you can only expect so much, okay? But... The guys, that kind of, all the hard work that I did, I, it seemed like they undid everything that, that I worked hard to do. And you know how that feels as a man. You're like, what? Come on. I worked hard for this. And I look at it and like, there was no, the satisfaction was only for a short time, but there was a hot, lot of hard work that was involved in it. It was full of sorrow. Solomon was thinking to himself, you know, I should have invested more time with my son, Rehoboam. I should have done more for Israel. I should have done more for my God. I shouldn't have allowed all these snares in the flesh being lured away by these, these women who would cause me to worship their idols. All these things. You know, when she, the, the queen of sheep became, and talking about all the great wisdom, it became so big, so, it filled it, it, it became so big headed that he was of no earthly good. And it was full of sorrow. His wisdom didn't go anywhere, he didn't share it with hardly anybody. I mean, we have the books here within the Bible, and that's the best that we have. But he was like everybody else, he passed off the scene. And unless you have God, it's all vanity. It's all vexation of spirit. I know it was short tonight, but I hope this challenges our heart. We can look at everything that we've done and we, we, we can understand that, that, that yes, our heart, we're, we're tempted to, to wander astray by the things that pull at our heartstrings. And again, you know, it's a lot of it, we don't see like there's, there's anything wrong with it. We, 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 we look at the things that drive our heart, our children. We, we, the, I mean, there's a lot of things that we go after. But if it keeps us from serving God, if it keeps us from loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our mind, and all of our strength, what use is it? We need to stop trying to follow our hearts. Stop trying to please our, ourselves with the things we think that are going to bring satisfaction and, and invest ourselves... And the Lord God Almighty. And then we need to realize that the pursuit of pleasure, if it's not for God, it's again, it's just a struggle, it's just a sorrow. It's not going to help anybody. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.
thank you so much for today. Thank you that uh, we, we were able to learn and grow so much closer to you. I pray that we allow this time to be a challenge to our hearts because I know that uh, we're all prone to wonder. We're all prone to, to go away from God. And this is a challenge to our hearts because I know we let a lot of things come between us and, and coming to church or even making an extra moment to come in for Sunday school to hear your word. I know that we allow so many extra things to, to keep us from loving you the way that we ought to love you. But help us to stop trying to pursue those things that we believe just bring pleasure to ourselves, I guess is what I'm saying. And let us seek to find pleasure in you. Lord, challenge our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. We'll sing a quick hymn of invitation. Hymn number 316. I have decided to follow Jesus. 316. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Verse 3. turn back. Brother Adams, you almost made it to 80. No turning back at this point, right? No turning back. No turning back. Brother Coon, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer? Father, I pray that you might help us all.